Hi class, I just wanted to um, start off this week um, saying I've enjoyed reading your discussion boards. Um, it's really great to see what you have to say. I appreciate your honesty and sharing where you're at. Um, I know we all come from very different backgrounds, belief systems, probably thoughts and perspectives on sexuality. Um, and our own experiences are probably all very different. Um, it's okay to be different than the text or the things that you're reading. Um, I just want to remind you guys, for those of you who are believers in the class and maybe um, have a lot of feelings about some of the things we're going to be discussing, when you decide to become licensed by the state of California, um, you can't discriminate because of someone being different than you, um, whether it be racially, spiritually, sexually, all those things. We cannot discriminate. Um, because that is illegal and unethical. And so um, for some of you, maybe you're like, oh, I'll never treat a couple who's um, maybe in a same sexual relationship. Well, you don't get to not treat someone because of that. Um, or, oh, maybe I won't um, see people who are living together. That's not an option. Um, you, you can't make those kinds of decisions based on lifestyle or religion or ethnicity, right? So we can make a clinical judgment based on something being out of scope of practice for us. So for example, someone is chronically mentally ill, they need a higher level of care than what you can offer, what your education provides. Yes, you can pass a client along in that regard, but not for the things I'm discussing. So I just want to make you aware of that because I have I've had a lot of students come in and they feel like, oh, I don't agree with this, so I'm not going to treat people with this. Well, it doesn't work that way. And clients come in with all different um, backgrounds and histories and information and even will say things like, oh, I'm a Christian, maybe even go to a church counseling center. And that is very subjective to a person nowadays. And so that looks very different for each person that comes into your office. So please be aware, our job as clinicians is to be, as licensed clinicians, is to be um, impartial. We are Switzerland, we are neutral. Um, we obviously behave in an ethical and legal manner. Um, and we treat people, honestly, the way God would like us to treat them and is to love them and meet them where they're at. Um, Jesus spent much of his time with people who were very different than the people that were very self-righteous and very much like, oh, I follow all the laws, right? Um, when he met with the woman at the well, he met her where she was at and told her about her life and spoke the truth and loved to her and offered her living water. He didn't shun her or not speak to her or all those kinds of things. So I think the greatest work we can do from a Christian perspective is, is to meet people where, where they're at and allow them to feel loved. Um, allow them to feel seen and understood like most people want. And regardless of who they are, where they come from, their situation. Um, so that's just my little plug I like to give students because sometimes I think people have an unrealistic expectation of what they're gonna get to do when they're out in the field. And uh, they're gonna be really rudely awakened if they're unaware of that now. Um, so, but again, you're not required to think exactly like the text or to think just like CBU thinks. We we can't control that. Um, so I appreciate your honesty and openness. And I hope no matter what, that you learn something and can grow and are better prepared for what lies ahead um, in, in dealing with sex and sexuality with your clients. Because again, it will come up. So just like for women, there can be a low sexual desire for men. Um, and, and maybe people are like, oh, that's not true because people have very stereotypical, um, ideas of men and, um, and how they think they are. Now, if that is going on again, we always want to rule out medical, right? Like what's going on that's causing the low to sexual desire. Is there a physical, um, situation that needs to be addressed? Um, is there a, um, is there a cognitive issue that's going on? Um, is there emotional things? Is there depression? Um, there can be a lot of things that are going on that could be causing someone to not want to perform sexually. Um, and so we're trying to like 
peel back the layers to see, okay, like we see the outer symptom. And this is a lot of psychology and a lot of what we deal with as clinicians, but we see the symptom and maybe it's like an iceberg, right? You see the top. And so for this circumstance, it's like the male notices, oh, I have low sexual desire. So we see the top of the iceberg, right? The very top, but underneath is like this bigger, bigger issue. And so we wanna, we start here maybe, cause this is what brings the client in, but we have to peel back the onion to see what's going on underneath. You know, maybe someone's realized that they have some trauma, from the past that they wanna deal with. Maybe there's something going on emotionally in their lives. Maybe it's, you know, re realizing they're aging, things are different. I don't know, it could be a lot of different things, but we gotta look at see one, is it medical? Two, is it cognitive? What's going on there? Um, what's going on with the person that they're trying to be um, intimate with? Um, is it something with that person? Uh, is it, is it just something that has to do with them individually? And so really trying to problem solve what's going on with the, the client so that we can better um, assess and better refer and um, just, you know, trying to navigate what, what, what's happening, you know? Um, there are different treatments for low sexual desire, um, you know, as we age, different hormones change in our bodies. And so is it a hormonal shift that's happening? Um, and that's causing the lower sexual desire? Is there weight gain? You know, all these things. There's all kinds of things that can factor in to um, a sexual desire issue. And so we just want to talk about it, rule out any negative self-talk, that's getting in the way. I think expectations are a huge issue when it comes to intimacy. People have an idea of what they want it to be and the reality of what it is is sometimes two very different things. And that can cause a lot of disappointment, frustration, um, maybe fear of vulnerability because um, intimacy is very vulnerable. Uh, it's, and, and, you know, for different people, it could be ego, right? Like this is very humiliating to me. So I don't even want to try because if I'm going to be humiliated, then it's not worth it to me, all those kinds of issues. Um, and so we just have to process that and, and know that this is a very vulnerable conversation, whether it be a man or a woman. And so trying to be patient with clients, allowing them to take their time and discussing it working through what's going on for them mentally when their body's not reacting the way that they want to or what's going on mentally for them when their spouse is asking for something that they feel like they can't give them or they don't feel like they're connecting with their spouse in that way or their partner that way really trying to process that with them because maybe in processing it that burden would be lifted and then the outcomes would be different and so with sexual dysfunction there's a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy that takes place Yes, there's techniques that we can do, right, with with arousal and trying to trying to see if we maybe aren't so concerned with again penetration or an orgasm, but just allowing ourselves to be close to someone, we might get a different we might get a different outcome because the pressure isn't so much on um, a person. Um, but again, we have to, we have to, again, peel back that onion and take our time and try to navigate what is really going on here. Okay. And that's the same, like we talked about that a little bit last week with women. It's the same with men. Um, premature ejaculation is something that some men experience and it can be again, very humiliating or embarrassing for men. Um, it's most common male dis sexual dysfunction. It's affecting between 20 and 30% of all men. That's a pretty big number, I feel like. Um, it's pretty common. Um, and so it's something that could come up. I think it's hard for people to come up. Again, we wanna always rule out biological factors um, and make sure you know everything's going on um, in a way that, um, that it should. And so consulting a doctor is always good. Um, there are multiple psychological explanations as to why men develop PE, and that's premature ejaculation. Unfortunately, none of these theories evolved from evidence-based research, so just be mindful of that. Um, psychodynamic theorists consider anxiety to be a primary um, agent in, in why people have premature ejaculation, so they're anxious, and so in anticipation, they can't, they can't withhold, and, and as a result, they go quickly. Um, and so 
in a behavioral learning perspective. Um, it's an early learned experience by reviewing the case histories of men with PE. Masters and Johnson noted that many men describe first sexual experiences characterized by haste and nervousness. So again, anxiety, um, maybe a lack of awareness. Um, but these are all things that can be worked on. Um, and, and it has it has an effect on a partner as well. And so um, it's just one of the things that like a partner has to work with the person and really work on maybe patience, um, maybe try a few different things. There's the start stop method where, you know, you start arousing and then you stop to try to work on control. Um, you know, I think due to sometimes some feeling of disappointment or shame that's a tied to premature ejaculation, um, people will not really talk to somebody about it because they're embarrassed. And so, um, you know, it's one of those things where trying to work through different, um, trying to work through different scenarios to help with the outcome again, a client once with a partner is, is important. So maybe getting to a point of arousal and then stopping, letting things relax, calm down, then starting again. Again, you need a partner who's willing to work with you. Those kinds of things can be done, can be helpful, and can be a very intimate experience. And the goal being that you're gonna get, of course, the outcome that you want. Um, I think sometimes too, when pornography is a huge if issue, um, when someone is watching a lot of pornography, an orgasm is very different than when you're in a person's body. And so as a result of excessive, excessive masturbation potentially, um, sex is very different and um, they're not getting the outcomes that they want, whether it be they go too quickly or they don't go at all. And so um, not getting the orgasm that they want with a partner. And usually that is very disappointing to whoever the person is with um, for a lot of different reasons, especially if they know the person has a pornography addiction. Um, it just really ruins things when it comes to intimacy. And so again, um, we want to, um, we want to address those things and kind of find out like, has this always been an, an experience? Um, is this been with every partner this person has had, you know, especially if you're in psychotherapy by yourself, where you can talk more openly about other experiences, not to compare or say one partner was better than the other. It's more about, let's get a history. Let's get an etiology of like, where has this all been coming from? Is this an always thing and never thing? first time thing so we can better understand what's going on here. Um, and so and just to be able to resolve and give the client skills that they need to get, again, a different outcome than what they're getting and to have less shame and embarrassment attached to it. This happens to 20 or 30% of all men. If not all the time, maybe on occasion this happens. And so really just trying to um, work with men on this and help them to not be so embarrassed um, and to give them skills to get, again, the outcome they want, um, to not have the same, same issue. Um, there are pharma pharmacology options. Um, there is medications a person can take that would re require going to see a physician or a doctor. Um, and I think the, com depending on the severity, the combination of psychotherapy, as well as meds could have a good outcome for somebody. Um, so again, you know, conversations to be had, a lot to be talked about. There are skills that you can do. Um, and I think that as long as the couple is willing to work together and or the person is willing to come to therapy themselves to at least sort out what is going on for them, then we can have um, really good dialogue and maybe give, like I said, some technique and figure out what's going on here that's causing all this going that's happening and you know maybe with some technique to work through they're not as intimidated to try and to try to get better at the situation um and consult a physician about it because there could be medical things going on or something of that nature especially if something wasn't happening like that before and then started to happen before now it looks a little different if this has been an always case right but if this has been not always and then it's changed all of a sudden something's going on that doesn't that doesn't sound right so what's going on um and we have to address those things and sometimes people don't even think like oh i might have a medical like they don't even think that way because they're like oh you know they're so deep in their shame that they miss 
they missed some things. And so that's our job to kind of point some things out, to bring some things to light, um, and then hopefully give some tools for, again, better outcomes than what they were getting. I hope this information is helpful. Um, I hope this helps you to have compassion for people because, um, again, very sensitive information it can feel very embarrassing to someone um, or humiliating or that's how they already feel. And so it's like we don't want to do that to people, not that I would imagine any of you would. And so it's really important with your facial expressions, uh, how you talk to people that you convey empathy, that you convey active listening, that you convey all those great skills that you've learned um, that show that you're here for them, you're coming alongside them in their, this journey, and you're hopeful for them to have, um, obviously, the the sex life that they, that they want within reason and within reality. So anyways, I hope you guys have a great week. I look forward to reading your discussion boards from week two. Talk to you soon.